Hi, and welcome to CardCast, where each week we discuss topics of interest with Lamar University Cardinals. I'm Shelley Batanza, Director of Public Affairs at Lamar University. I'm just going to start the session off by saying, before this pandemic, I was a weekly curbside shopper. And now I can't even seem to find a time that's three days to a week away. So I find myself at the grocery store more than I want to be. I'm trying to plan meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for my family of seven, husband, three kids, and my older parents um, for at least a week. I'm trying to plan all that for at least a week out, right? So the, that task alone makes me want to sit and eat an entire bag of Oreos. Uh, so not only am I looking for tips to help me plan better, but also stay healthy and not eat from the stress, boredom, or just sheer entertainment of eating, you know? Um, and so that's what we invited Chef Charles Dewitt on today. He's a clinical instructor at Lamar University's Nutrition, Hospitality, and Human Services, and which is one of my favorite departments on the um, LU campus. Um, he cooks at LU and all over the place. Um, Chef is uh, an instructor at Del Mar College and Lamar University and has been for 18 years, Chef? Is that how long you've been? 20. 20. 20. 20 years. Plus, you just retired from food, food service director at uh, Calder Woods, correct? Yes, ma'am. I was there for 16. Wow. Um, and But you've been an executive chef for over 30 years. We really appreciate you joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, and I, I should mention too that you're 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 famous in your own right, but you're also married to the famous, or should we say, infamous, uh, Debbie Bando. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Very excited about that. Yeah, it's a good thing. So, um, before we get to the nitty gritty, why don't you just talk about what you do at LU? Well, I teach all the culinary classes for the uh, hospitality and the dietetics and nutrition students. Uh, dietetics and nutritionists have to have at least one culinary lab. And then we have a culinary program that is uh, accredited through the American Culinary Federation. And I teach all the culinary classes for that. Is that, is that a big department? Do you have quite a few students right now? Uh, we're a small department. We're part of the education department. We have probably about 150, 200 students total in our department. That seems like a big group. Now, you also do some things on campus. You'll have some events on campus, um, and I've attended those. In fact, anytime I hear that you guys are cooking, I try to, try to attend. But I went to, I think it was a wine dinner back in the fall, and then y'all do lunches periodically. Can you talk yes, about both of those events? We look for um, opportunities for the students to get some opportunities to develop some skills, some actions. And uh, sometimes it's easier to have bodies than it is to uh, create something and go do something else. So we work with other activities already on campus. Uh, this time that you're referring to was the President's Ball. And uh, we, we worked on that for the uh, scholarships. We also, the uh, lunches, the Cardinals on the Run, we do that every third semester. And we, uh, speaking of curbside service, this is what it is. We, we do it every day, uh, every Monday and Wednesday in the classroom. They are responsible for developing their own menu, their own advertising, their own grocery list, their own costing. Then they have to come and cook and sell it and clean up. Very good practical experience. Um, and speaking of grocery store, that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, can you can you save us from ourselves? Can you can you? Can you help us plan ahead for meals and walk us through how we can um, go to the grocery store effectively and not run back and forth? Well, my first thought would be to see what you already have in the house, what you have in the cupboards. Um, take and plan your menu by what you have in the, already there because some of that stuff will actually need to be looked at because of the expiration dates. You'd be surprised how much food is in the cupboards that are already expired and people get sick from already preparing it again. And so, but this way you also prevent you from duplicating other things you already have. In my house, we always have pasta. We've got pasta. We've got probably 10, 15 different types of pasta. And we always seem to get more pasta. It seems to be like <laughs> the stuff that we always pick up when we're in the store. And so, um, Pasta also has a, a, a shelf life. If you get too long, you have issues with that as well. Hmm. I don't think I knew that pasta had a shelf life. 
Uh, and pasta is a good thing to have around because you can do all kinds of things with pasta. I mean, you could just mix it in oil and you could uh, do some kind of marinara or some type of white sauce. Um, are there any other staples that you think we ought to just have in the pantry at all times? Um, we have peanut butter. I'm, I'm thinking of what I, we have in our, we have peanut butter. We have olive oil. Uh, we, we don't have sugar and flour because we don't do a whole lot of baking at home because of our, of our jobs. We do a lot of that at the work. We don't do that at home. Um, we have canned vegetables because we have a limited freezer space at home, limited refrigerator space. I would say the one of the best things to do is to try to make sure that you get your five fruits and vegetables a day somehow, whether they be fresh, frozen, or canned if you have to. But you still need to work on your vegetables. Got it. So uh, what foods last longest? I guess you're talking about the, the frozen and the canned foods. Those are things that we should maybe stock up on. Instead of buying toilet paper, maybe buy canned vegetables and, um, and frozen fruits, right? Well, if you've got the freezer space, one of the projects that the students did this semester when we went to online was I had them inventory their pantries at home and show me what was in their pantries at home so we could identify things they could use to cook with in, at home for their class projects because they weren't allowed to come back to campus and cook on, in the labs. And so we had to design the program around what they had available to cook with. And so that's what we did work with what was in their pantries. What's there already. Um, what's the easiest thing to make for a group? I mean, I've got seven people in my house. What do you put together for, for families, for big families? Well, it depends upon what you're looking for. If you're looking for something that's stretched with the pasta, you can make it either a hot dish or you can make it a cold dish with cold salad. Um, you could actually take in, um, make a dessert out of it if you would need it to, a Krugel. Uh, so, it, so it gives you some variety, some different things. But for seven people, uh, I would always tr do something to stretch the meal. I would always do something with, with rice or, or uh, legumes. I'm, I love black eyed peas. I, I don't think there's anything better than a black eyed pea that's cooked right. And so uh, that's why I like to have the legumes available. They stretch and they go as a protein supplement so that I can actually do a smaller portion of protein if I've got some legumes in there in my menu. Got it. Chef, I want to talk to you about the proper way to cook a black eyed pea, but I want to shout out to Sherry Mueller and Joanne Brown. Thanks for tuning in with us today. Um, so the proper a way to cook a black eyed pea. I, I mean, you just piqued my curiosity. I got to know. I've probably been cooking them wrong all these years. Tell us, how do we properly cook a black eyed pea? Well, if it's dried, you want to soak it for about an hour. I like to cook mine with Zumo sausage. That's mm -hmm. where the flavor comes in. Some people like to use ham hogs. I like a little more zing with my Zumo party sausage. And that's what I like to do with, with mine. But I also put onions in it as well. And I cook it from the start with the onions and the sausage. Got it. What about a crock pot? You do any crock pot cooking? Uh, no, I don't. Everything is done on the stovetop. If we're doing black eyed peas, it takes 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half. Depends on how much is in the, the pot itself. But they, they keep and they reheat good from day to day. How long can you keep? How long can you keep legumes in the in the refrigerator? How long will they last? Once they're cooked, mm -hmm. three to five days safely. Okay. What about other foods? How long will it keep in there? Because I love some leftovers. I love to I love to cook up a whole bunch of stuff and then you know have different things Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and by Thursday I just get out all the leftovers. How can I keep things from Monday and they're still going to be good on Thursday? Some things are, uh, it just depends upon what they are. It depends upon how long they've been out, how long they've, they've been in the danger zone, which is 41 degrees Fahrenheit, which is room temperature, and how long it's been in the refrigerator. Uh, just because it's cold when you take it out of the refrigerator doesn't mean that you've stopped and killed all the bacteria because you left it out a couple of hours the day before. The idea okay. is to get it refrigerated as quickly as possible. Okay. 
And the danger zone, say that again, 41 degrees? 41 degrees to 135 is the danger zone. So anything you leave out room temperature is considered a danger zone. That's when the bacteria starts to multiply. And every, every few minutes it starts to double. And so that's why people are concerned about leaving stuff out at room temperature. Got it. Got it. What things can you leave out at room temperature? I'm going off script, but I just got to pick your brain for personal. Um, <laughs> well, for surprisingly, personal surprisingly, there are some things like like eggs. People think you got to refrigerate the eggs. In Europe, they don't refrigerate eggs. Yeah. yeah. They don't refrigerate the eggs. Um, there, There's milk and dairy. Most of your dairy products you want to keep refrigerated, of course. But, um, I mean, ketchup. Meat? Cook ketchup. Meat, ketchup. You keep your ketchup in your refrigerator? Yeah. You go to a restaurant, where's the ketchup kept at? Oh, on the table. How about that? <laughs> so, I mean, it, there's enough preservatives in the ketchup and in the mustard alone to, to keep them still safe when they're room temperature. You know, and sometimes you want to refreeze up, free up your refrigerator space so you can put other stuff in, some fresh produce mm -hmm. in. And so that would make the difference. What was your question? Um, well, first, let me tell you, I think some of your students are missing you. Um, you're getting hellos from Cindy, Regina, and Emily. They want to say hi to you. <laughs> hi, girls. <laughs> They're missing you. Cooked meats. Can I leave cooked meats out? I mean, if I've cooked a big old brisket and I've got it out, and if I just put it in foil, can I leave it out on the counter? Is that safe? No, ma'am, it's still in the danger okay. zone. Okay. Let's 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 try and say something. You know how we do turkey at Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yes. Now we eat turkey for a late lunch and then we leave it out and we eat it again that night without necessarily bringing it to a full heat, full temperature to kill the bacteria. And so um, people do it, but also people have di uh, they suffer the consequences. Got it. Yeah, that does it kill you, but uh, you do suffer the consequences. Yeah, you're not gonna, we're not gonna like that too much. Um, so, Chef, we're getting a question from our viewers. Um, you're famous for your gumbo. Do you make your own roux? Yes, ma'am. Can you talk uh, about that? That's hard to make. Well, I prefer to make my roux in the oven. To be honest with you, I like to take and um, you take melt your butter and add your flour and you stir it together and then put it in the oven and you let it cook there for about uh, oh, 30, 40 minutes. And you want to take and let the roux begin to smell nutty and dark brown. You can stir it on occasions, but you want it to be darker brown. You're, you're not trying to burn it in the oven. You're trying to brown it all evenly in the oven. And also it allows me to do something else like chop onions or some celery if I need to. Uh, while it's cooking in the oven. The neat thing about doing it that way is I can do it that way one day and make my gumbo the next day because I, I can cool it down and it doesn't need refrigeration after that. The Got it. Kind of do it in parts. I like when that. You look at a time and timing and sometimes you need to plan things ahead so that you can get something else accomplished. Exactly. Is that a 350 oven? Yes, ma'am. 350, and it just depends on how much the uh, roux I'm trying to make. Um, if you look at recipes about gumbo, the more up north you go in the country, the lighter the roux is. When you get down to here to uh, Louisiana and Texas, Southeast Texas, it's always darker. And the difference between a, a dark roux and a burnt roux is the taste. And we just prefer a darker roux here. We prefer a darker roux. And what happens is it actually adds color and it doesn't thicken the, it doesn't work as a thickening agent in the gumbo. Interesting. So, so what else do you like to make? What are some of your favorite things to cook? Oh, I enjoy a good tuna fish salad. Now that sounds crazy, but I love tuna fish and I put, I put mayonnaise and relish. I put avocados and tomatoes in it, and then I eat it on a bagel. Now, that's, when that when Debbie's not at home, 
that's my go-to meal. She does. Well, because she's the cook and you're the cleaner, right? Right. When you have two chefs in the house, you have to kind of figure out your boundary lines, where they're at and how to work with them. I think it's also with marriage, but you know, I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, what do you, um, what do your students like to prepare the most? This is a question from uh, one of our viewers. What are the students really into and, and what do they want to know how to cook? Well, I think some of them are, are just the point of discovering food itself. I, I've got several students who eat mushrooms for the first time in my class. And hmm. I, I have a hard time envisioning that, that they've never had a mushroom before. Um, but when they taste it, I've gotten mixed responses. I've gotten good, I've got bad. Um, people are trying to think about how to cook more things other than protein nowadays. Uh, I've got more vegans and more uh, uh, vegetarians than I do I've ever had before. And they're trying to uh, influence what's going on in, into the kitchen and the recipes that we, we do so we can modify them so that some of them have food allergies. Mm. And learning how to cook without flour, without wheat flour if you've got gluten issues, uh, makes all the difference in the world. I find that it's interesting that people are reverting back to some of the old cake recipes they used to do in the early years, the 30s and the 40s, that doesn't have, uh, that uses vinegar and, and eggs as a yeast, I mean, as a uh, builder, emulsifier. Um. We just heard from your wife. She says she thinks that you're cooking tonight. I just wanted to throw that in. Thank so, you. <laughs> yeah, you know, it says hello and, and ask what you're cooking tonight. If you had to go home and cook tonight, what would it be? Well, since since we have my mother-in-law and my wife, there's three of us, I've got to fix something. Um, as you say, I, if you go to the store, I find out if you go to the store this time of the day, it's not as bad. Or if you go time to the store early in the morning when it first opens up, yes, it's not as crowded. Uh, I don't find the shelves any fuller or any less fuller because they're just not there. Right. But I find the variety still there, but I can make something to do. So you're an early morning uh, grocery shopper or mid afternoon? Yes, ma'am. Yes, me too. Uh, Bell Marian asked us, what are the best procedures for freezing items you just cooked? Does it need to completely cool? Yes. What, happen, what happens when you freeze something, if, if it's a liquid? Have you ever seen an ice cube? Yeah. In an ice cube tray, how the water kind of bends up and starts, makes a point? Yeah. But what happens is when it starts to freeze, it freezes on the outside and it forces the water as is liquid to the center and that's why it freezes in points. And so you wanna try and make sure that everything's the same temperature when you start to cool it so that you don't have those, those issues. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Can you freeze? I just talked to someone who uh, grew her own mustard greens, cooked them and then would freeze them and have them for the winter. When you do something like that, do you have to add water, a little bit of water or liquid to the vegetable? Yes, when you have to, to par blanch them, you've got to par cook them. You have to cook them half the way before you can freeze greens. And um, otherwise it, it, it won't work. It, it, you have to cook them then cool them down and then freeze them. Now, Chef, uh, pretty stressful times right now. Are there certain foods? I mean, I guess we all define comfort foods in different ways and different things may be comforting to me, but are there certain things that um, you would say everybody would agree with is, is a comfort food and that, that maybe we need to be cooking right now to, to comfort ourselves? Well, I think it's important that everyone knows what's a comfort food and it's whatever makes them feel a happy, warm feeling inside. And it's, it's going to be different for everyone in a household of seven people. you probably got seven different comfort foods. This is true. Yeah. It could be more. What, what is your, what's your comfort food? My comfort food is my tuna salad. Oh, yeah. 
What about Debbie? What's her comfort food? Pasta. Are you plan pasta. Any kind of pasta? Any kind of pasta. Her, hers is eggplant. Uh, eggplant. It's called uh, pasta alla norma, and it's yeah. done with eggplant and the marinara sauce. Are you going to share your tuna salad recipe with us? I can. Um, it's just tuna salad. Tuna. I'm sorry, canned tuna fish in water that's been drained. Mayonnaise, pickle relish. I love pickle relish. Sweet pickle <laughs> relish. Sweet pickles. And then I take and add it, and then I take a, a tomato and dice a tomato up and I dice an avocado up. I'm stirring it all together, and there I've got it. I don't even add salt or pepper to it. I like it just like that. That sounds delicious. And no egg? No egg. Okay. That is that is a little bit different. It sounds great. Um, are there foods right now that we should probably stay away from just because we're in this, this place of um, stress and um, uncertainty? I, I really don't think so, and, and here's the reason why. Because I think it makes everyone look at the, the epidemic as in a whole different situation. You know, we're trying to get things back to normal. And there's nothing wrong with, with eating the food that we like. Um, Debbie and I support the restaurant industry. We, we go out three or four times a week just to support the restaurant industry. Because we, we want them to also support us. But, but it's the idea is that the restaurant industry has done nothing to deserve what's all going on. They couldn't mm -hmm. control or anything. And they still have families to feed, mouths to feed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, so you'll see me and Debbie going to different restaurants, curbside. We're learning how to do the curbside just like everybody else, the call ahead and the wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it offers a nice variety too. I found myself getting really bored with, um, you know, my, um, my my recipes. I mean, after what are we five, six weeks in, and um, cooking the same thing over and over and over again. So it's nice to go to those curbside um, and get a, a different, something different, a variety. So well, we've had some great experiences with some of the curbside. We've had some that have been okay, but we've had a couple of great experiences, and and those are the ones that you remember. And those are the ones you want to go back and you want to continue to support. Even Absolutely. if it's just going back and, and buying a gift card to support them, it, it would make a difference. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Joanne Brown, who's watching with us, um, wants to know if we have any famous chefs who have graduated from Lamar University. Uh, locally, we've got uh, we've got uh, Casey Gates, who is now at uh, McKenzie's Pub in Brentwood Country Club. Yeah. Uh, we have a young man by the name of uh, Joey. Now. Jeff? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was it Joey? Did I, I didn't catch the last name or where he I is. was trying to think of his last name. He was oh, okay. He was here in January for our, our president's dinner. Oh, okay. Okay. He was one of the features. He came in from... Uh, Buffalo. Yes, I remember, and I but I can't remember. <laughs> I remember him here, and I, I can't remember his uh, his name either. Well, we've got a lot of local graduates um, who, who you know they stay in this area and they cook in this area. We have we have a few, yes, ma'am. We have a little more to take that actually take and leave. Um, we we brag about uh, Jason Black, who's over at Papa Does. He was one of the first people through the uh, department in hospitality. Um, it was long before my time, but, but we, we brag on him and the relationship that we have with Papa Do's. Uh, you know, we, we'd love a suggested week menu from you. What would you do um, or what would you cook in a week? Well, ideally I would try to do something and, and not cook anything more than once that week. Just just to have some variety. For instance, I might choose to do uh, chicken twice in the whole week, but I would do them completely different. I would do one that would be baked, or one that would be grilled, 
And uh, I would do one bone in, one bone out so that they would appear to be somewhat different. Um, I'm becoming less and less a steak person, if you could believe that. Don't ask me why. I think it's old age. But um, <laughs> I'm also learning to eat my steak a lot less cooked. I like it medium rare now, bread as opposed to medium or well done. And of course, Debbie and her mother like it rare. So I'm having to, to do, tread the line a little bit. Well, it sounds like you're moving in their direction, which I think is probably good for you. It's healthier. Yes, for sure. What, are, what about starches? Do you add a lot of starches? Do you do a lot of rice and corn and uh, quinoas and things like that? Do you do a lot of rice, a lot of corn, um, legumes, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we do uh, tons of pasta. We'll have pasta two or three times a week, but that's what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had kids, I would do something that maybe the kids would eat. And mac and cheese is something that the kids will eat 99% of the time, always. And they, I would do something to enhance the mac and cheese. Something uh, yeah, that would be different. with like wieners chopped into it or something like that. That's what my kids want, you know. Uh, anything else you'd like to share with us, Chef? Um, just that everyone needs to think about what they put in their bodies. I'm learning as an older as an older man that I had decisions to make when I was younger, and I didn't make the right decisions necessarily. And so, as I get old, I find out that my body starts to deteriorate differently, and I start looking at why. And it's because I I now know that I didn't do the nutritional things I need to do. You know. Uh, in my latter years, last year I became a diabetic. Um, it took me 65 years to figure that out. Mm. And so I'm just saying that there are things that I know now that I wish I had known even 10 years ago that I could have done differently to change my lifestyle. And what would you have done? What would you have changed? I, you know, I think a lot of people are missing that knowledge, they don't know what is healthy and what is not healthy. So what would you tell your younger self? Well, I keep saying pasta, you know, pasta is a carb and pasta turns into sugar down the road. And I should be cutting back a lot on the pasta, definitely a lot on the sugar, a lot on the sweets. I mean, I used to go home and, and would, would eat supper and then I would have a dessert and the dessert might be two or three pieces of candy or something like that. And then I'd go to bed, and that's not the way you do things. That's not the way you should do things. Um, I, I learned the hard way. And so, um, like I said, as you get, I, I, I feel like I'm a Ford. And if you know anything about Fords, you know they call it Ford, fix and repair daily, you know, the cars. <laughs> as, old, as the car gets old and wars, goes out of warranty, everything starts to fall apart. Well, that's the way I feel sometimes. That, that my body parts are falling apart and they're not like they used to. They're under, they're out of warranty. And they don't have car shield for body parts. I wish they did. The, the, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sad trick. We've got to take care of our bodies when we're young and eat the right things. So in, in place of pasta and other things, I mean, uh, fruits, vegetables, lean fruits, meats. Fruits, vegetables, cut back on my meat. I mean, it would be nothing for us to have a 10 or 12 ounce steak. And you don't need that much protein. You need about three ounces of protein. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder if, if my body just needs three ounces, what does my body do with the rest of it? Right. And so, Interesting. Are these things you're teaching to the students now in your class? Well, they take actually take a nutrition class, which helps a little bit more. I teach them how to cook and how to think some things through, because we do do some um, some ethnic things. Uh, Odalise is this year has brought in a lot of uh, Peruvian cooking into our classroom. Oh. I'm very grateful for her and, and her expertise in the area, and so. We're learning that other people in other parts of the world have how they're dealing with some of the food issues. 
I want to know what you've been doing during this pandemic to teach class. I mean, are you, you doing, um, I mean, it's all online. Are y'all doing videos or, or how's that going, Chef? Well, the students are taking it and they're having assignments. And I had to build the assignments of, around what they had at home. So they had to do an inventory of their uh, pantries and show me what was in the pantry so we could come up with some ideas of what they would be doing. Excuse me. So their, their assignments revolved around developing a menu that they would use in-house and they would feed their family, which made sense because all of a sudden now they're having to go out and buy groceries, something that normally when they're in classroom, they wouldn't have to worry about doing. And so they had to take a, pic, take a picture of their mise en place. That's all their stuff in place so that I know that they've gotten it all together. Then that picture of them cooking, prepping, cooking, and then the finished product. In one class, they had to cost out the whole meal. In another class, they had to do the video on knife skills. And so I'm learning how to um, to work with the videos and, and the pictures. Someone uh, actually did everything in the PowerPoint, which made it a little bit easier. And so I'm learning how to um, communicate differently. I, I can't smell. I can't taste, and if the lighting's bad, it looks bad on, on a plate. So all I can do is critique what I can what I can see on on the film or on the monitor, sorry, and then uh, go from there. Well, it it sounds like too. You could call one of the family members and say, "Hey, how was that?" <laughs> You know, was it too salty? Was it overcooked? Well, I'm sure they, the they, have to, they have to give a report on what the people said that <laughs> ate it. Oh, that's so, good. But um, if if I had started the semester out all online, I'd be doing things a lot differently. But since we had already been in classes for half the semester, we got some of our basic stuff down, taken care of that we didn't need to worry about. So, right, right. Hey, this question just came in uh, and I know we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes, but I wanted to ask you because it's a personal question too. One of, one of our um, viewers is asking it, but I'd like to know too, because I've recently got an air fryer. Any tips? Do you use an air fryer? Any tips for using an air fryer? I've not used one. Uh, I hear it's pretty incredible and uh, it's, it's better for you. Mm -hmm. It actually cooks faster for you, so it means that it seals in the moisture. It seals in a lot of the the uh, nutrients and, and makes it a little bit easier for you. Um, I, like I said, I have not tried an air fryer. Well, I really like it. My family likes the result. I've been doing wings uh, in the air fryer, and um, they they think it's just fabulous. So maybe I should uh, come over and take a class from you. Well, yeah, I'd come over and just, well, I'll just cook for you. You know, that'll be fun. You bring the dessert and I'll do the, I'll do the chicken wings. I could do that. <laughs> I like it. All right, chef. If there's not anything else, I guess we'll, uh, we'll move on. To, we've got a Lamar University commercial, but um, anything else you'd like to add? Um, we didn't say anything about eggs. Oh. I, I was, a, I was a bachelor for 48 years. Oh my. And eggs yeah. was, was part of my staple diet. Five nights a week. <laughs> and um, when I explain to my students, when you're cooking eggs, you use one pan, one one pan to do everything in, no matter what you add to it. Whether you made an omelet or a frittata, it didn't matter if you did it over easy. Um, it just, eggs are something that are pretty, pretty wonderful as far as food and for supper, breakfast, lunch in between works out pretty good. I would agree with that. You know, eggs were uh, a little bit in short supply. You could only get two dozen when you went to the store. And so I would I would go to the store and I would get two, two dozen and then I would send my husband, you know, maybe the next day to get another two dozen because we eat a lot of eggs. I was really worried that we were going to run out of eggs like we ran out of toilet paper. Well, around Easter, everyone was, cut, was dying the eggs as well. So that's why some of the run on the eggs was in. So... But you're right. You're thank right. You. Any other special foods? Eggs are your go-to. Anything else? No, I think that's about it. All right. 
Chef, it's been a pleasure talking to you. You've got to, uh, you don't have a whole lot of time to go home and cook for your, your famous, infamous wife, uh, Debbie. So have a good evening and Thank thanks you. for joining us. Thank you. We'll see, see you another time. All right. Uh, thanks for being with us here on Cardcast. I'm Shelley Batanza, the Director of Public Affairs at Lamar University, the pride of Southeast Texas. We'll see you next week. Stay by, stand by for our commercial. I want to help people. I want to be a part of the solutions of tomorrow. I want to bring innovations in times of need. I want to turn my passion for helping others into action. I want to be the voice that shares truth with the world. In times of uncertainty, being a nurse is how I will make a difference. My professors have taught me human resources is about putting people first. Through the power of mechanical engineering, I've learned how to better the world around me. Because of Lamar University, I've been given the opportunity to change my world. To change our world. Our moment is here. Our moment is now. Make the most of it at Lamar University.